Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there. This is a re-recording of the Digital Technology and Basic Number Sense Instruction webinar that we held on February 13th. Uh, the reason I'm re-recording it is because uh, the screen wasn't showing for the first part of the webinar, and uh, so I'm doing it again so you can see all the slides um, in, uh, when, if you watch this recording. Um, oops, sorry. Okay. Uh, we started with a little activity for people who came into the webinar early, um, where they looked at uh, the number 13, and people shared with us um, things about the number 13, and then we asked this reflection question. Uh, what did you learn about the number 13? How to do math, culture, someone in the group? And it seemed pretty evenly split among those four things. Uh, not that many people participated in it because it was just for people who came early. And then we asked the question, how could this activity help develop number sense? Uh, then I introduced myself and I'm Tracy Mullins and I'm working with Alpha Plus as an organizational development consultant. So for people who know Monica and Maria and Gillen, um, we all have the same job title. Uh, I'm a literacy practitioner who's interested in digital technology um, and how it works well with the instructional practices. When I started working with technology, um, it was quite a long time ago and I was immediately intrigued by how um, learners engage differently when they use technology. And uh, I was sort of inspired by all the aha moments that we had. I'm not a numeracy instructor. I have integrated numeracy instruction into literacy curricula in a community-based literacy program. And everything I know about numeracy instruction, I learned uh, from Tom Cianconi, talking to him, and from reading uh, Kate Nonsuch's excellent materials. I don't know if you know those literacy practitioners. Uh, Tom is from Toronto and Kate is from British Columbia. Um, and I'll talk more about them uh, later in the, in the webinar. You'll see a, a lot of Tom stuff in the in the webinar because I used uh, uh, photographs from a project he worked on to illustrate some of the pages in the presentation. So today we're going to talk a little bit about number sense just so we have a common understanding of, of what I'm talking about when I say number sense and a little bit about what the research tells us about why developing number sense is so important to becoming numerate. Um, some of the information from research about where digital technology can help. And I'll give a couple of examples in the, uh, in the webinar of some apps that uh, people are using um, with some success. And then there are appendices uh, with more apps and websites. Some of them are teacher tested. Um, they're either being used, we know they're being used by LBS programs in Ontario, and one comes from a case study that I'm going to present to you. And some of them have been researched by Alpha Plus. Um, uh, um, some of this uh, webinar uh, was presented at the Connex uh, conference. So if you were at that presentation, you'll get a sense of deja vu as we're going through this. Um, and Monica did a lot of research on apps for that presentation. So those are in the appendices too. The appendices come in the form of a handout, which is um, I'm going to say posted below, <laughs> but if you're on the Alpha Plus webinar page, it'll be posted here as well. And it was sent out to all the people who registered for the webinar. Um, so, yeah, so that will be uh, that resource I mentioned. And, um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Okay, so there's Tom in that picture. You can see he's got his name tag on. So the first question we're asking is, what is number sense? Uh, number sense is the understanding of uh, hello. Um, uh, uh, this is the understanding we're using for this webinar, and that number sense is a subset of numeracy. It's how we understand numbers in a in a general way. Uh, we use number sense when we count, when we round up, when we estimate, when we compare quantities, when we work with proportions, and when we use strategies to solve number problems. Um, it's the way we use math every day without necessarily calling it math. Um, 
so we use our number sense when we are trying to figure out if we can fit our car into a parking space um, or not. <laughs> Researchers have found that students who are most successful with number problems are those who are using different pathways. So one that's numerical and symbolic, the one that we teach when we use a skills-based approach, and the other that involves intuitive and spatial reasoning. So if people are using both those pathways, they will be um, more successful than people who use one of those pathways. Um, number sense is also how we choose strategies when we try to solve problems. So people who use number sense well are those who can use numbers flexibly and also can pick a good strategy that's effective and not too time consuming. So um, in the webinar, I asked people to think about this question. Can you figure out what 18 times 5 is in your head? So just take a moment and think about how you would figure it out. What would your strategy be? And then I asked people to just report on uh, using a poll in the, in the webinar to tell us which method they chose. So did they just use multiplication? Did they use multiplication and addition, multiplication and subtraction, and or did they use another method? Um, a lot of people use the multiplication only, so a lot of people know their 18 or their 5 times 18 uh, is a known fact for them. Um, and a lot of people use multiplication and addition. Uh, fewer used um, uh, multiplication and subtraction, and there were some people who said other, so I, we're not sure what, how they figured it out. And this is just a chart showing some examples of how you could um, figure this out. And of course, there are probably more, as we learned. Some people use the other method, and we didn't ask them how they did it. Um, and then I tried to show this little video. Um, and this is Joe Bowler. And that last example of... Um, the question came, comes from Joe's presentation, and uh, so I'm just going to play this little video now. It's about four minutes long, and it's her talking about some research um, that came from England. So there are very few research studies, very, very few, that I have read. And I immediately thought the results were so powerful they needed to be blasted from the rooftops and everybody should know about them. But here's one. Uh, two British professors, Eddie Gray and David Tall, worked with 72 students between the ages of 7 and 13. And they had asked teachers to nominate students they thought of as above average, average, and below average. They then gave the students various addition and subtraction problems to do, and they categorized their strategies. For example, they gave them problems such as 7 plus 18, which is the addition of a single digit number to a teen digit number, as you can see here. And what they found was that students used four different strategies when they worked on number problems. So the strategies were some students counted all. So with 7 plus 18, they would say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and count up to 18, and then to add them, they would count them all again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and go on like that. The slightly more sophisticated strategy of counting on is when students would add up to 7 or to 18 and then continue on. So if they'd added 18, they would then say 19, 20, 21. Uh, known facts was when students just knew what the, uh, the number bonds, they just remembered them. And what they called derived facts, which I would call number sense, and which this whole session is about, was when students were able to break numbers apart and decompose and add them and use them uh, flexibly. So, for example, they might say, uh, with 8 plus 17, I'm going to take 8 plus 2 and make that into 10. Um, and, or they may break 17 into 15 plus 2 and then calculate uh, 15 and 2 and 8. So they make the problems into easier addition problems. And the results from age, the eight-year-olds were stunning to me. So the above average students, 30% of them knew the numbers. They used facts, known facts. 61% of them knew, used number sense, so they used the numbers flexibly. And 9% of them counted on. In the below average group, 6% of them 
use known facts. None of them use number sense. 72% of them counted on and 22% counted all. When they worked with the 10 year olds, they found that the below average group were using the same number of known facts as the above average eight year olds. So they're sort of caught up in the number they remember over time. Um, but still virtually no number sense, and instead they were continuing to count. So why is this finding so important? The researchers who did this study put it well. They concluded that the low achievers, so often thought of as slow learners, were actually not working more slowly, but they were learning a different form of mathematics. And what's more, the mathematics that the low achievers were learning was a more difficult form of mathematics. And low achievers also are often identified as low achieving in school, and the help that they can then often get is more procedures, um, more emphasis on doing procedures very carefully, rather than um, being taught to use numbers flexibly, and that's probably the very, very last thing. Okay, and I have included this transcript from the video in the presentation, in the slides. Um, just in case the video doesn't work. Um, and um, uh, I ended up reading it out in the presentation. So I'm going to read it out now in this uh, re-recording. Um, but you can skip the next five slides if you, uh, if you, you can just skip ahead if, uh, if, the, if you got the information out of the video. Two British professors, Eddie Gray and David Tall, worked with 72 students between the ages of 7 and 13. They asked teachers to nominate students they thought of as above average, average, and below average. They then gave the students various addition and subtraction problems to do, and they categorized their strategies. For example, they gave them problems such as 7 plus 18, which is the addition of a single digit uh, number to a teen digit number. What they found was that the students used four different strategies when they worked on number problems. Some students counted all, so with 7 plus 18, they would say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, up to 18, and then to add them, they would count them all again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc., and go on like that. The slightly more sophisticated strategy of counting on is when students would add up to 7 or to 18 and then continue on. If they got to 18, they would then say 19, 20, 21. So that's counting on. Known facts is when students just knew what the number bonds are and they just remembered them. Derived facts, or what Joe Bowler is calling number sense, is when students were able to break numbers apart and decompose and add them and use them flexibly. For example, they might say with 8 plus 17, I'm going to take 8 plus 2 and make that into 10. And uh, they may break 17 into 15 plus 2, and then calculate 15 plus 2 plus 8. They make the problems into easier addition problems. The results from the 8-year-olds, the above average students, 30% of them use known facts. 61% of them use number sense. They use the numbers flexibly, and 9% of them count it on. In the below average group, 6% of them use known facts. None of them use number sense. 72% of them counted on, and 22% counted all. When they worked with the 10-year-olds, they found that the below average group were using the same number of known facts as the above average 8-year-olds. So they did seem to catch up in terms of known facts, but were still using no number sense, and instead were continuing to count on. The results from the 8-year-olds, uh, the above average students, uh, 31 a 30, oh, I think this is the 10 year old, sorry. They 30% um, use known facts, 61% of them use number sense, and 9% of them counted on. And in the below average group, 6% of them use known facts, none of them use number sense, 72% of them counted on, and 22% 20, uh, counted all. So why is this important? The researchers who did the study concluded that the low achievers, so often thought of as slow learners, were actually not working more slowly. They were learning a different form of mathematics, and the mathematics that the low achievers were learning was more a more difficult form of mathematics. Students 
who are identified as low achieving in school often get help by attending classes with more emphasis on doing procedures very carefully rather than being taught to use numbers flexibly. And that's probably the very last thing that they need. So if we go back to the 18 times five uh, question, um, how many people use the known fact? So they just knew that 18 times five or a derived fact. So both of these strategies are good numerate behaviors, but our ability to use derived facts demonstrates our number sense. So how can uh, developing number sense as well as learning math facts help <laughs> literacy students? Um, taking a number sense approach can help reduce math anxiety. Uh, research into numeracy instruction tells us that learners who develop a strong basic number sense will be better able to move on to solving increasingly complex problems because they'll have that uh, strategic approach. Um, mathematics facts are important, but memorizing facts through methods such as times tables, repetition, rote practice, and time testing does not help people develop the flexibility they need for complex problem solving. And it can increase math anxiety for some people because um, there's sort of that performance anxiety piece to uh, reciting times tables. And people feel that if they don't, if they can't do that, then they can't do math. In order to be a good reader, to read and understand novels or poetry or just basic documents, we need to have memorized the meanings of many words. But literacy teachers do not usually give students hundreds of words to memorize and then test them under time conditions in order to assess their reading ability. We, we, we look more at reading comprehension um, if people have the reading, uh, reading skills to do that. Um, so in some senses, learning mathematics facts is to number sense as learning phonics is to reading comprehension. So both things are very important, but to say you're reading, the comprehension is the most important piece. And um, in, in terms of numeracy, uh, number sense can be said to be um, sort of like the reading comprehension piece. How are you strategically problem solving? Uh, we have some homegrown research from here in Ontario that points us to a number sense approach. Tom Chung, Coney, Flora Hood, and Joy Lehman did a project in 20, uh, 2007 called Beyond Worksheets. Um, you'll see these uh, listed in, in the handout, um, how to get to these reports. Uh, there's the full report, and then there's also a practitioner summary, which is... Uh, sort of pulling out the information that's uh, most useful to practice from the report. In Beyond uh, Worksheets, they define numerate behavior as managing a situation or solving a problem in a real context by responding to information about mathematical ideas that is presented in a range of ways and requires activation of a range of enabling knowledge, behaviors, and processes. Becoming numerate includes understanding how to apply a task process cycle to problem solving. So understanding different strategies and under, knowing different things about mathematics and then understanding how to apply them when you have a problem. So which strategy, which facts, which um, known things about mathematics will help you to solve a specific problem. And it includes a holistic approach to de developing numerate behaviors. So becoming aware, aware of yourself as a numerate person, um, uh, making personal connections throughout the learning process. So why are you doing the things that you're doing? Being able to choose the uh, appropriate skills and strategies and, uh, and being able to create the meaning, meaning in your daily life by by doing these math problems um, so that they're, they're reflective of your life and, and they have purpose. Research also tells us that um, some of the methods that help us develop number sense are number talks, uh, student collaboration and sharing ideas, the use of manipulative 
manipulatives and the use of real world data. So number talks are kind of what we did when we talked about 18 times five and, uh, or what we did in the beginning when we talked about the number 13. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, student collaboration uh, and sharing ideas is sort of another way of doing number talk, but having students share with each other their different ways of doing things makes students understand that there's not necessarily one route to the correct answer and that different different strategies and um, are equally valid um, and it helps them compare which strategies are more effective so and which strategies might get you to the answer more quickly if if speed is uh, of interest to you. Uh, uh, manipulatives, I think everybody knows what those are. Those are any kind of um, handheld uh, uh, things that you use so to show fractions or multiplication facts or um, any of that kind of thing. And then real world data where is using authentic materials to um, to teach math this so how does digital technology help us uh, when we're developing number sense? So researchers see the internet as a powerful tool. Um, it's not uh, a panacea, uh, but uh, there's definitely a lot that um, we can uh, that we can use through the internet, providing opportunities for uh, number talks, for example. Um, the internet also opens up possibilities for student-to-student -student communication and collaboration, places where students can share ideas, definitions, examples, strategies, solutions, and applications that may be real-time or uh, asynchronous. So you can have students coming on all together uh, to do some work, or um, different students come on at different times and post their ideas and their strategies and how they figured out a problem. Um, in the Guides to Effective Instruction, which are uh, from the Ministry of Education, they are uh, guides for people teaching uh, in, from kindergarten to grade six. But one of uh, there's some very useful information in those guides uh, about teaching numeracy, um, even though it's uh, directed at teaching children a lot of the strategies that they use that practice strategies that they use, I think, would also apply to adults equally as well. And one of their recommendations for doing number talk is creating word walls. So a wall about uh, terms and definitions and, uh, and strategy walls for um, where people can put up different approaches to solving problems. So you can see in this wall, um, there's kind of a combination of things happening here. So it's some of it's about the terms and some of it's about strategies. And if you look down the, uh, the right side there, you can see that there are actually um, uh, learning strategies as well, like uh, not just mathematical strategies. Okay, uh, two places where you can uh, do this online quite easily. Uh, one is called Padlet. Uh, Padlet's a great tool. It's very, very simple. It's very easy to use. Um, you can set up a Padlet and nobody needs to have an account to use it. So uh, that's helpful. Um, you might want to make an account when you set up your Padlets, uh, but it's free and you don't have to give them a lot of information. Uh, but then you can always have access to your Padlets easily. Um, and then you can just give students a link to the Padlet and they can, um, they can post, um, they can use their real name, they can use um, a made up name. You can see on this Padlet example in the, in the slide here that people have chosen a variety of ways of identifying themselves. Um, and you can, add, you can also on the Padlets, this is just words on this one, but you can add images as well. Um, and, uh, uh, lots of other things to make it a little more colorful. You can choose your backgrounds uh, and you or you can upload a photograph as a background and have students um, I, I do things on the photograph, identify different parts of the photograph um, and or respond to it. So this one was on, uh, as you can see, how and why is creative thinking important in maths? So I'm guessing it's in English, maybe. Um, one because they're calling it maths, so the diff different students have uh, put up their ideas on the Padlet. Um, Pinterest is another place where you can create boards. 
So students can't write directly on the Pinterest boards, but you can add things. Um, so you could, um, this is a numeracy and number sense one that Monica found when we were doing the Connex uh, presentation. Uh, now for Pinterest, everybody has to have an account. Probably some of you use Pinterest. It's a, uh, uh, people use it for all kinds of different things. Um, uh, in this recording of the webinar, you didn't see the poll, but we uh, this uh, using Plickers is an app that you can use um, to uh, poll students on on uh, questions. So everybody gets one of these little cards, um, and depending how they hold it. So they can be up to uh, four answers, and depending, you know, which direction they put at the what part of the card they put at the top, that is their answer. So you can't really see on this thing, but on each side it says A, B, C, or D, and uh, you can so you can do uh, multiple choice questions with four possible answers, and then only one person needs to have a device. So in this case, that person's using a tablet. You can use a phone. And then you, uh, whoever's scanning, they scan the room once everybody's made their decision. And it works really well if you have a projector. Um, and what comes up behind you is a, you can either have a graph or you can have, you can put in the students' names. And so each student is identified and how they answer is identified, or you can make it anonymous. So just a graph shows up um, with the responses. Um, it's great. People really like it. It uh, always gets a great response. It sounds kind of complicated, and when you're setting it up, it feels like it's complicated, but it's actually quite easy, um, and it, it sort of adds another element. And it's kind of great. I mean, you can easily do this just by doing a show of hands with a group of people, but this is just sort of a, a more fun way to do it. And um, also, you get to keep the results. You can save the results of the poll, and so if you're doing something where you're going to ask people a question and then you want to ask them the same question later and see if their idea changed, it's great because you can kind of keep a record. Well, at this point, 70% of us thought this, but now that we've done, you know, this lesson or we've talked about, had this discussion, you know, now 20% of us think that and more of us think another thing. So it can be interesting for that kind of thing. Um, Another place to where you can um, do number sense, uh, uh, number talk, sorry, uh, more of an individual practice is Quizlet. Um, I don't know if anybody's using Quizlet. It's quite easy to use. It's free. You can do lots of stuff there for free. It's, there are paid accounts. Um, and if you want to, I don't think they're hugely expensive. I can't remember how much they cost right now. But uh, so if you want students to go in and you want to be able to track their activities, um, you can pay for an account, but you don't need to. Um, and if you're using it within Classroom, you can uh, Google Classroom. You might be able to, it's integrated with Google Classroom, so you can keep track through Classroom instead. Um, and you can build activities um, that uh, use flashcards and games. Uh, there's lots of resources there that you can use uh, that other people have built. So you don't have to always make your own. You might find one. Um, that uh, works well for your purposes, or you might find one that you just want to uh, change a little bit. Um, so that's great too. There's lots of ideas there. Um, and once you get in, you can, uh, the, every time you make one, the students will also, you can make it so it opens up on a certain activity, on a certain way of using the cards, but um, the students can also then choose uh, to, use different, I think they call them modes of learning, but so you can learn, which is just reviewing the information. You can use flashcards. Um, you can, uh, there's a writing activity. Um, you have to be pretty good at typing to do the writing ones and the spelling one where they say a word to you and then you have to type it out. Um, there's a test for each one, which is great because once you've done some of the other activities, you can test yourself to see how well how well you've learned them and how how, much, how well you remember the information. Uh, matching game and the gravity game is fun, but you have to be quite a quick typist to um, to use the gravity game. Um, things are falling from the top of the screen, and you have to type something in before it crashes on the bottom. Um, 
So it's for the good typist, or you can create uh, ones where people, you know, maybe put in a number or something uh, rather than having to type a word. Um, another great thing about the internet, of course, is real world data. It's a giant library of real world data. Um, this is a the example of somebody who, of a group that was working on the Titanic. So, um, and sometimes these, uh, these kind of projects are good for cross-curricular um, classes. So some reading, some writing, some numeracy, all included in, in the same, using the same uh, materials and the same uh, investigation, sort of project-based kind of thing. Um, I don't know how many people are using FLIP. This is another great source of real world data. It's something that we've all pro probably done in our classes, which is use flyers. Um, to talk about shopping and prices and figuring out, you know, what's cheaper um, by looking at quantities and the price for that quantity. Um, but this is a great app. It's a great app, even if you're not a math teacher, it's a great app just in your daily life. You go to the website and you put in your postal code and then choose what kind of shopping you're doing, grocery shopping, electronics, you can kind of vaguely see down the side there what it is uh pharmacy automotive uh, hardware that kind of thing so put in what it is you're looking for and uh flyers from all the shops around you all the stores that are close uh to your postal code will come up and you can put in a range um so for some people you know i live in downtown toronto so lots comes up um, it, depending on where you're living, the number of stores that come up could be quite different, of course. Um, and then within that, you can then narrow down your search. So if you wanted to find, if you were doing groceries and you just wanted to compare the price of blueberries in three different grocery stores, you could type in blueberries and you would get um, all the mentions of blueberries in that, uh, in that flyer. So um, it's, it's great fun. Um, and it means you don't have to go out and collect all the flyers and cut them up and hope that they have information in them. So this is a little activity that Monica made uh, for our Connex uh, presentation um, uh, on, use, on how to use Flip. Another app that probably lots of us use is Google Maps. Um, and uh, that helps you find locations, and you can uh, look at uh, travel times um, and you can uh, also change when you leave, what time you're leaving. So if you're, especially if you're looking at a public transportation option, um, you know, changing what time you leave can change the amount of time something will take you, or you can change your method of travel or your, um, uh, your route. So if you're driving or walking or uh, riding a bike, you can change your route and see how much longer it will take you if you go this way or that way. And here again is an activity that Monica uh, created for the Connex presentation. Uh, this is uh, in Toronto, obviously, um, talking about going from uh, Eglinton uh, to uh, Young Street down uh, to Dundas Street down uh, Young Street, and the difference: how long would it take by car? How long would it take by uh, subway? Um, you could also add in, in Toronto, you can add in the biking or walking options as well. So, um, and if there would be any other route that would, would work better. So I think on the biking stuff, they also show you bike paths sometimes. That's probably only relevant to cities with bike paths. Um, another place to get real world data and just a really interesting site is um, the MathEye site. So this site really um, thinks about how, uh, uses a number sense approach to their whole site. Um, they have a poster competition every year and um, people submit posters of, you know, math that they can see in real life. And you can see some examples. We saw the example previously on one of the slides of the how many triangles could you see? And it was the picture of Doritos. Um, so uh, it's really about, you know, seeing math in everyday life. Um, but they also have the GeoGebra app there, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, yeah.
Okay. Um, another possibility for using the internet is, or and using apps is uh, the virtual manipulatives. Now the research shows that um, nothing really beats having physical objects in your hands and working with them on a table. Um, that that's uh, nothing. Um, virtual really replaces that experience for people and and the learning outcomes are much better when people are using the real hands-on materials. Um, I saw an interesting presentation at eCampus which is about um, the difference between using a plastic model uh, if for medical students using a plastic model to learn uh, about biology um, uh, as opposed to using virtual models. And they've done a lot of research on why um, the $300 plastic model gets better learning outcomes than the virtual things that cost thousands and thousands of dollars uh, for medical schools to use. Um, and uh, they thought it was the being able to hold it in, in people's hands, and it's not that. Um, but they think there's something that's happening in people's brains. Anyway, they're getting kind of close to knowing what, what it is. And maybe uh, once they really understand what it is that um, is uh, that makes the, the um, real life thing better uh, for learning outcomes, they'll be able to develop virtual ones that work better. But that being said, uh, virtual manipulatives are are important and and can be used. They're great for modeling and they're great and demonstrations. And the other great thing about them is that students can use them in different settings, so they don't have to carry their their blocks or their fraction cutouts and that kind of thing with them. They they can uh, they can and they can practice you know on their phone or on a tablet if they have access to those kind of devices. Um, the Math Learning Center has lots of apps uh, that are manipulatives so you can see some of them here the number frames uh fraction stuff there's one that's uh the number line thing there's ones with that have um scales and you can you know um add material to each side to try to balance your scale you know those kind of things okay um yes sorry so uh one of the things uh that uh, I wanted to share with you too was this case study. I wanted to just uh, point you to this study from uh, the National Adult Literacy Agency from Ireland. And they did a study on, case studies on uh, numeracy practice, what different teachers were doing. And I'm just gonna highlight uh, the first one, the case study one, because in this study, the uh, instructor uses a lot of digital technology. Um, Different instructors use different amounts of digital technology, but because of the um, topic of this webinar, uh, the first case study really kind of fits in with what we're talking about. Um, of course, we could have developed great case studies from Ontario. There's uh, Alpha Plus. We see lots of great practices happening across Ontario, but um, using this ready-made one also helps us introduce you to this really good resource from NALA. So this guy in the case study one, he talks about how he uses iPad apps. Uh, he uses iPads uh, in his class. Um, so some of these things are very specific to using iPads. Um, but he, um, they, some of them are applicable to other devices. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about the case study is um, him talking about his process of choosing technologies, which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that, but uh, it's quite interesting to read. Um, so in terms of number talks, he doesn't really talk about technology in this arena. He um, encourages discussion and collaboration among learners. So he has learners working together a lot. Um, and he wants to get learners involved in doing activities as soon as possible. And he uses the classroom and the environment outside the classroom. So he sends his students, there's a good example in there. He sends his students out into the parking lot and they're measuring car wheels. And I can't remember why they're doing that, but uh, it's quite interesting. He gets them all out uh, of the classroom doing stuff. 
Uh, he uses uh, real-world data, and he uses a lot of PowerPoint presentations in this class and videos, especially from YouTube. So YouTube's great because you can create your own playlists for students and uh, or for yourself. And uh, there's lots of great stuff there, um, how to do things and math classes and that kind of stuff, as well as uh, looking at real-world data. Um, and uh, here's that example from MathEyes again. So he uses the MathEyes resources, and he uses the NALA resources, which are in Ireland, but are available to all of us because they're on the internet. Uh, he really finds that the iPads work well for um, using manipulatives. Um, he uses a lot of those kind of apps, and he thinks that the iPad actually, because of the uh, gets past the sort of problem that apps have um, because uh, of the touch screen. So, um, you know, which any tablet has um, that, uh, so they can actually use their hands to manipulate the, the shape, the shapes or the, or, you know, creating, uh, using fractions and that kind of thing. Uh, so these are the ones he uses, and they are all in Appendix A of the handout, uh, a little description of them and a link to find these different apps. So he uses Numberline, which you can also find at the uh, Math Learning Center. Uh, tap Tap Blocks and Think 3D Free are ways of using shapes so for doing geometry. Um, uh, tap Tap Blocks lets you put blocks together and... Uh, 3D free is actually these 3D shapes that you can create. Uh, protractor first, it's fun. It's um, it's a protractor for uh, figuring out angles, but it also has a converter in it. So um, so you don't have to use two things. You can use one thing. Uh, volumes, um, which you can uh, see uh, different different shapes and calculate uh, their volume and. Um, uh, the only one that works for both Apple and Android is GeoGebra, which is the MathEyes uh, uh, um, geometry apps. It's a set of apps and resources. It's a great site, and it's great that it works for both. Um, all the other ones are just uh, for iPhone or iPad. Um, the other th interesting thing is that he talks about in the case study is uh, how he brings new ideas into the classroom. So rather than bringing new ideas and methods straight into the classroom, he keeps them in reserve. So when he learns about something new, and uh, he he doesn't necessarily start using it right away, he he keeps that idea in his head, and then you know he might be working with a student or a group of students and think, you know, what would help these people is um, uh, to do this thing that they're trying to do is this app and. Uh, uh, then he'll he'll sort of pull that out. He talks about learning about GeoGebra and uh, um, how he didn't use it. I think for a couple of years he sort of he really liked it and he was really interested when he learned about it, but he didn't he didn't apply it right away. Um, and he also talks about what he thinks the benefits of using technology are. are. So um, we'll see if this. Uh, uh, reflects your experience as well, but he feels that the learners are more motivated to practice outside classes, whether they're using technology or not, um, when they use technology in the classroom. It, so I'm, I'm not sure why, he doesn't really talk about why, but that, um, and that using the iPads, for him, what he feels is it helps them pick up new concepts much more quickly. Um, so, uh, it seems to be one of the benefits is that it in, using technology kind of encourages independent learning. Um, so, and he talks about the instructor benefits, the benefits that he sees for himself using technology in his teaching. Um, and he feels that it makes him more open to trying new ideas and strategies, whether or not they're ones that use technology, that just using the technology and sort of thinking through some of those things kind of helps him open up his mind to lots of new ideas. So those are the benefits that he sees. Another big benefit for us as instructors 
and practitioners uh, of the internet is finding a community of practice there. So even if it's not a place where we actually talk to people, we can find what other people are doing um, that can either reinforce us, our own practice by saying, yeah, other people do this and it's good, it's working for them too, or finding out about new things. Um, one of the things we hear a lot when we uh, when we talk to people in the field is they they often ask us like, are other people doing this or what are other people doing? So um, going on the internet is one place where you can uh, find your choir, your band. Um, one place to to look at how different uh, Canadian uh, practitioners are doing numeracy is the Social and Hope Holistic Approach to Numeracy website, which was a project. Again, Tom was interested, uh, was involved in that, uh, as was Flora, uh, Joy, you can see her in the picture there with the students. Um, and under the activities tab there, there are activities that uh, were developed by the, the uh, project leads, and then also different activities that uh, came from different participants in the project. Um, and also their ideas about teaching numeracy, and their approaches and different resources are available on that website. Um, another great resource that we have, that Canadian made resource is from Kate. Uh, Kate's in the process of sharing everything she's learned about teaching on her blog. And if you scroll down, you'll see a section on math. There's lots of great information there that goes way beyond teaching math as, um, for all of us who are literacy practitioners. But uh, the math section is is great. Um, there's practical um, practical things. So as you can see, fractions on your feet will is our practical activities. And then there's uh, sort of approach ideas and what to do if you're afraid to teach numeracy, because some people are. Um, yeah, so you can find all that on Kate's blog. Oh. I'm just going to go back because Kate's actually working on a comic book now about multiplication tables. So she got in touch. She couldn't come to the webinar um, because of the time, but uh, she is working on um, something about, about how to teach uh, math, um, multiplication. So uh, she's promised to get in touch when she's figured that out, when she's got it ready. And uh, we can share that with you then. Okay. Um, another great site that's not uh, numeracy specific, it's um, but it's a uh, it's a great place. It's called uh, the Cult of Pedagogy. Oh, I didn't even put the name at the top, but Cult of Pedagogy, and it's run by a teacher. Now she's an ESL teacher, so you, it's not literacy specific or it's not numeracy specific. But one thing she does every year is she does the six ed tech tools to try in you know whatever year that's. Um, and I think it started in 2015, so there's uh, several sets now. Um, and that's where I found out about Plickers, for example. So um, usually when she's talking about applications, it's around language teaching, but you can easily see how you can apply things. And I like the um, these lists, the six ed tech tools to try in a certain year because they're really easy to get information out of there's just a list of six things she's got a little blurb about how she uses it a little blurb that comes from the um from the people who made the the app or the website and then a video on how to use it so it's all very concise and right there it doesn't take a lot of time to review them um and it, you know in each, in each list you might find one or two things that uh that you would want to use with your students um, and there's also this uh, professional development site that is the Ministry of Education. So again, it's directed at kids uh, teaching children. But um, one of their goals is increased educator math knowledge and pedagogical expertise. So some of these, some of their resources will be helpful to numeracy instructors as well. Um, two places on that site that I thought would be uh, interesting for us is their resources. So again, they're resources for kids, but in many cases, um, they're, you can use them with adults. There's nothing, you know, sometimes there's, um, you know, childlike graphics on things, but some of them don't have that. So you can easily use them. And also they have the virtual learning sessions, which are for practitioners. Um, 
Um, again, not all of them are going to be useful to uh, adult numeracy instructors, but uh, some of them will be, right? Because they're more about approaches and uh, methodologies than um, directly around how to teach kids. And I included this here in our community of practice because uh, I wanted to put it somewhere because I don't really know much about it, but it looks really very cool and I, I, I do want to explore it more and I, I wanted to share it with you. It's called Citizen Maths and it's from the UK. So you'll see in the leveling and stuff, when they're talking about levels, they talk about GCSEs and that kind of thing. Um, but the, the idea is that um, it's pitched for people who came out of left school at 16 and they should be at this level, what they call vocational level two um, in England, but they're, they don't feel like they are there that either because they've been out of school for a while or, or they didn't gain those, those skills while they were in school. So it's, um, it's a site. And I, to me, it looks like a, it would be a cool site to sort of learn together with students. Um, and it's not it's sort of based on it's I feel like it's well uh, it's good for people who are working within the OAL, ALCF because it's not about uh, it's not skills based it's uh, based on sort of practical math and uh, looking at different ideas so you can see here these are the sort of big ideas that they're looking at so proportion, proportion uncertainty representation patterns and me measuring and then um, you can see sort of what math what numeracy applications each idea underpins and then how it is put into action in the classes so um, in a sort of real life instance um, so again it, it looks like it would work well with the task-based approach in the OALCF So um, I want to say to get in touch with us, if, if you want any help using any of these resources or any that are in the handout um, and in the appendices, uh, we can help you. So we haven't gone into great big detail about how to use these different things in this webinar, um, but we could, um, you know, if you, if you want to try one and you're having trouble with it or you just want somebody to do a demonstration or something like that, we can uh, we can set it up. Or if you want us to research something a little bit more by letting us know what your specific needs are, um, we can uh, we can look into something and see what we think um, would uh, help you uh, best, and if a certain resource would work for the application that you want to uh, use it for. So you can get in touch with me. Uh, I'm Tracy, and that's my. Uh, email address down there and my phone number and extension or you can go to the staff directory at the uh, on the Alpha Plus website and uh, under contact and uh, uh, you can find Monica, Maria and Gillen there um, if you'd like to work with any one of us. Oops, sorry, I went ahead. Um, and uh, this is just to show you what other um, things you'll find in the handout, so uh, in the resources handout. So um, I've listed some of the research that I, not all of the research I read, but the stuff I thought might be um, useful to practitioners and, um, and helpful if you want to read some of the research about number sense and number talks and uh, the, or the use of manipulatives. There's tons of stuff on that. Uh, on, uh, people have done a lot of research about using manipulatives and also that resource I mentioned the guides to effective instruction where to find them at the Ministry of Education um, it's on the edugains.ca site and the first appendix is the apps from that uh, case study so I call these teacher tested so these are the ones that the teacher uses um, you'll see them all listed with a, a link uh, to get to them. Um, and uh, so I mentioned all of these. There's the protractor one, the volumes. This geometric cabinet, you, it, you have to pay for it. It's not hugely expensive, but, you know, it's five bucks, so that's something. And uh, 
you uh, it might have been free when he was using it. Sometimes things are free for a while and then they they end up charging for them. And this one to me looked a little like just the way it's laid out looked a little kid like. So um, you know you might want to check that out for yourself to see if your adult students would appreciate it. And this is the Geo Gibran. You can see how beautifully it's set up and. Um, the different calculators you can use and the apps that work for uh, Apple, Android and Windows. So um, they work for everybody. So that's great. And then you also have the resources page that can be really helpful if, even if you're not going to use the apps. Um, and these are, and then there's some apps that uh, Monica did some research on for the, uh, the Connex presentation. So those are listed in the, in the handout as well with links to how to get to them and then the last part is websites that we know LBS programs are using so um, things you probably already know about but the Khan Academy where you can um, there's lots of lessons uh, and it's nicely set up and it co it covers a lot of topics um, as well and uh, GCF learn for uh, GCF learn free um, which I think lots of people know about. They've got great stuff on how to use computers and how to use technology and stuff, but they also have uh, math skills as well. Um, and BBC SkillsWise, which is the English site uh, that lots of people use for um, math and for uh, reading and writing as well. Okay, so once again, oh, oh, sorry. And uh, the last one is Wolfram Alpha. I don't know how many people are using this. Some people find it a bit weird to use, but you ask a question or put in something you want to calculate and it will help you find the answer. So uh, uh, it's an interesting site to use and it's sort of a problem solving place to go to. Um, I'm not going to show you this video, but it has a kind of a cute example of, of uh, math in real life. Um, that you might be interested in looking at and just once again get in touch if you want to talk about any of these resources or if you want any help with any of this um, stuff um, let us know and uh, and uh, we're here to help okay thanks everybody for your attention and uh, see you um, online or in real life somewhere in uh, the Ontario literacy field thanks again